Welcome back to the online causal inference seminar. Today, we are excited to have Michael Hudgens and Chen Hua Li, uh, who will talk about efficient non-parametric estimation of stochastic policy effects with uh, clustered interference. Um, after the talk, we will have a discussion by Hyun Sun Kang and Chris Harshow. So this time, we're going to have a more open discussion, um, uh, as you might have seen uh, last time. Uh, questions today will be handled to Ying. So Ying, you quickly say a few words. Uh, thank you, Dominic. So today, as usual, please submit your questions through the Q&A section. Um, if that's a um, quick clarification question, I'll try to raise it to the speakers uh, quickly. But uh, for the others, we'll um, keep it uh, uh, until we, we reach a point that they uh, stop for questions. So please do submit it through the Q&A section for us to better track it. It is a small button at the bottom of the uh, Zoom window. So with that, um, uh, please feel free to uh, get started, Michael, and the channel. Chamwa, can you share your slides? Yeah, sure. Um, is it looking okay for everyone? Yeah, yeah okay. that looks great. Thank you. So thank you uh, for the invitation to speak today. Um, <clears throat> I just want to acknowledge the organizers of the online causal inference seminar series. I think this is been absolutely wonderful and I've really enjoyed uh, attending these seminars over the last few years. I, I think you all are to be commended. Uh, you've done a tremendous service to the, the field of causal inference and, and thank you for everything that you're doing. Um, so the work we'll talk about today is on uh, non-parametric estimation of stochastic policy effects with clustered interference. Um, this is work uh, led by Chama Li, who is a PhD student uh, in the Department of Biostatistics here at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, <clears throat> Chamwa has been fantastic to work with and he'll he'll be finishing up in a few years. For th so for those of you looking for a, a postdoc, I couldn't re recommend anyone more strongly than, than Chamwa for your consideration. Uh, this is also um, joint work with uh, Dong Ling Zhang. Next slide, please. Um, so this group's well versed in causal inference and the associated lingo, but just for completeness, uh, we use interference to mean uh, the setting where the treatment of one individual uh, may affect the outcome of another individual. Uh, interference may be common in many different settings, including economics, um, educational studies. Uh, our group's motivated by infectious disease applications, so thinking about settings like um, maybe evaluating the effect of a vaccine and thinking about the possibility that the vaccine uh, vaccination of one individual may affect the outcome of another individual. Uh, many other areas where interference uh, may be present and, and may be of interest to study, including political science, social network analysis, spatial analyses, and so forth. Uh, in this talk, we'll be thinking about the specific setting where we have um, partial or, or clustered interference, and by that we mean that we can partition individuals into groups or clusters such that we're willing to assume that there's no interference between individuals in different groups, um, but we will allow for uh, the potential for interference uh, within the groups or within the clusters. And so our goal at the end of the day will be say something about uh, treatment effects uh, that allow for and, and potentially quantify interference if present. Next slide. Uh, one of the interesting aspects of the causal inference with interference problem is there are many different estimands uh, that we might target. Um, in this talk, uh, we'll, we'll think about um, sort of average outcomes under a counterfactual setting where uh, a policy Q has been adopted, where Q governs the conditional distribution of treatment uh, given covariance. And then we'll define uh, average uh, potential outcomes under that policy. So mu Q would just be the average potential outcome under the policy. Mu A Q would be the average potential outcome um, when an individual receives treatment A under policy Q. And then define causal effects as, as contrasts in those average potential outcomes. So for example, uh, an indirect or spillover effect might be defined as, as mu naught Q minus mu naught Q prime. In other words, what's the average outcome when someone's not treated and you change um, the, the proportion of people around them treated according to policies Q and, and Q prime. Next 
Next slide, please. Um, so we know in causal inference, if you do a randomized experiment, usually inference about treatment effects is straightforward. So in this setting, what might be an ideal randomized experiment um, when you have clustered interference? One idea would be to do a two-stage randomized experiment uh, where in the, the first stage you randomize groups to different uh, policies, say Q0 and Q1. And then in the second stage, randomize individuals to treatment or control where the probability they get treatment or control depends on uh, the policy assigned to their group in the first stage of randomization. Next slide, please. So for example, this is a, a real uh, example of a two-stage randomized experiment uh, looking at the effect of a cash transfer program. In this study, the, the groups or clusters were enumeration areas in the Zamba district, Malawi, and the individuals were uh, never married females, ages 13 to 22. Uh, and in this study, they used this two-stage randomized experiment where in the first stage, they randomized the, the groups or enumeration areas uh, to one of four possible uh, Q policies. Uh, and then in the second stage, they randomized the participants to receive treatment or not uh, with the probability of receiving treatment depending on the, um, the policy assigned to the group at the first stage. Next slide, please. Um, and there have been many papers written on inference for two-stage randomized experiments by some by our group and, and by others as well. Uh, basically, um, it's fairly straightforward because uh, there is the assumption that there's there's no interference um, and also independence between clusters. And then because of the two-stage randomization, one need not worry about confounding um, either the cluster level or the individual level. Next slide, please. Uh, but today we'll be talking about <clears throat> uh, the observational data setting. So um, we don't have the, the luxury of, of randomization um, and we need to worry about um, the possibility of confounding. Uh, there have been several uh, papers written on this topic over the last decade or so. Um, generally, these, these papers um, assume random sampling from some superpopulation of groups or clusters, and then there's some version of a no unmeasured confounders assumption. Uh, for example, um, Chechen Chechen Vanderbilt in 2012 proposed uh, kind of an extension of the classic IPW estimator where uh, the weights are based on the inverse of a, a group level type propensity score. Um, more recently, Lou et al. proposed a parametric doubly robust estimators. And uh, Park and Kang showed that um, one of those estimators in that paper is uh, locally efficient. Um, and then uh, more recently, um, Chocladar was a student in our group proposed an extension of these ideas that allow for right censored outcomes using inverse properly censoring weights. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so the, the methods I just described on the previous page, these methods for observational data, uh, generally target the same estimates as in the two-stage randomized experiment. In other words, they contemplate a scenario where individuals independently select treatment with the same probability. And in some papers, this is called a type B policy. I think the B standing for Bernoulli. So thinking of individuals independently selecting treatment with the same probability is essentially a Bernoulli distribution. But in the observational setting, it may be that other counterfactual policies other than the type B policy may be more relevant and interesting. In particular, if we're studying a setting where there's interference within clusters, um, we might expect there to be some dependence between individuals with respect to their propensity to select treatment. Next slide, please. Um, so Georgia had a paper in 2019 and uh, Barkley et al. in 2020, and these papers were similar, and they essentially um, thought about estimates that instead um, shift or, or modify the treatment distribution. So if you sort of think of a propensity score distribution, think of kind of shifting that in one direction or the other. And there's some nice aspects, uh, appealing aspects of these estimates. Um, the, they permit treatment selection dependence within clusters, um, both in the factual and counterfactual 
setting. Um, they also preserve the ranking of individuals within a cluster by the probability of treatment. In other words, if if I'm more likely um, to to select treatment than than Georgia um, in the real world than in the counterfactual world, I'm still more likely to select treatment uh, than Georgia. Um, and then third, these these are based um, uh, maybe at one kind of downside of these estimates is that they're based on uh, some assumed parametric model of um, the A given hex distribution. Um, so in this paper that Chamwa will be presenting to us today, he's going to consider a general class of estimates um, that do not require uh, parametric modeling of, of A given X. Um, and he'll present um, non-parametric sample split estimators, um, which allow flexible data adaptive estimation of nuisance functions and result in estimators that uh, achieve the usual uh, parametric rate of convergence. Um, so I see the uh, question in the chat about Q versus A. So Q um, is um, uh, the counterfactual policy, and, and it's just describing uh, the distribution of A given X in some counterfactual scenario. So one, one Q is the type B policy, where you each person um, receives uh, treatment or not with the same probability. Uh, Chanwa will describe other possible cues. Little a is just a, a possible realization of uh, treatment for an individual. And for the purposes of, of the presentation today, we'll only be thinking of a, a binary a. So little a will either be zero or one. Um, so with that, I will uh, pass it over to Chanwa. Oh yeah, thank you for the or like wonderful introduction to the interference, Michael. So as Michael explained about what is the cluster interference and what kind of work has been done, um, I will really present about our recent research in more details and more technical, like with math. So I will start with some definitions. So we assume that our observed data consists of M clusters, where there are NI individuals in each cluster I. And for unit J in cluster I, we observe YIJ outcome, AIJ binary treatment, and XIJ covariance. And then this bold yi is vectoral yijs, and same for aixi. So this bold oi is the observed data for cluster i. We also define script a and i to be set of all lengths ni binary vectors, which will be domain of uh, vector bold ai. We can also define potential outcomes, which is yij ai, potential outcome for unit j in cluster i, when individuals in the cluster I receive treatment assignment according to AI. So for example, assume there are three individuals in a cluster I, and then if AI was 1, 1, 1, which means that in this setting, uh, what is the JC individual potential outcome if all the individuals in the cluster were treated? For the occasional convenience, we sometimes decompose this AI vector to the AIJ, AI minus J, where AI minus J is the vector of AI case other than AIJ. So under this notation, if there were no interference, this YIJ potential outcome will not depend on AI minus J. So AIJ comma AI minus J will have the same effect on the potential outcome with AIJ comma AIJ my AI minus J prime. Um, and then I will uh, formally define what is the Q. Um, so we think about some counterfactual scenario that A cluster size a cluster of size Ni with cluster of covariance Xi receives treatment Ai with some probability with notation Q given Ai, Ai given Xi Ni. So we can think that this Q is actually a probability distribution on Ni, A Ni. So one example would be deterministic policy where this Q value is one if and only if every Aij equals one. So this means that under this policy, every individual is treated and there are no probability for any other possibilities. And then type of policy could be expressed in this form uh, where Q function is product of alpha to the AI, AIJ times one minus alpha to the one minus AIJ, which really looks like boundary distribution. However, this type of policy might not be very interesting as Michael explained because this uh, alpha is same for all individuals. And sometimes we want to assign treatment to individuals based on their covariage. So Papadur Geruk and then Barclay et al, they proposed this GLM shift policy 
by assuming GLMM on this AI given XI NI model in the observed data, then they shift this beta coefficient to the gamma to get a counterfactual policy. However, there is also a limitation for this policy because it highly depends on this GLLM modeling. If the model for AI given XI and I was misspecified, then the um, estimation and inference might be really um, biased. Therefore, in our work, we propose to uh, we propose some example policies which does not depend on a parametric policies. And here are one policy named by SIPS policy, uh, which is stand for cluster incremental propensity square policy. So this is an extension of Candy's work to the closed interference setting. So here I start with pi ij, which is probability of aij becomes one given xi ni, which is this individual's uh, propensity core. Then we can define pi ij comma delta to be shifted propensity core. We all hear delta is a user specified known function. So for example, you can choose delta to be some constant delta naught, or we can choose delta to be inverse proportional to total size. Uh, the construction of this delta uh, pi ij delta is following uh, is from the following relationship. Can you see my mouse here? Um, maybe not. Yes. Oh, yes. cool. Yeah. So we see this following indication that the O's of treatment in the counterfactual scenario is delta times the O's of um, observed uh, observed O's. So that's how we get this pi ij delta then we can eventually construct this Q policy. So this policy can answer some questions like, what is the risk of COVID-19 when the O's of vaccination were two times the observed O's? The other policy that we propose is TPB policy, uh, which stands for Treated Proportion Bound Policy. So under this policy, uh, we see that Q value will be zero if AI bar, which is proportion of AIJ, a proportion of treatment in a cluster, is less than some threshold low. So this describes the counterfactual scenario that the proportion of treated individuals in each cluster is at least low. So it strictly assumes that the proportion should be larger than low. Um, so this policy can answer the question like, what is the risk of COVID-19 when at least 50% of individuals in each city are vaccinated? So it's different from type B policy because type B policy uh, is overall 50%, and this policy uh, requires the proportion to be at least 50%. And then for the SIPS policy and TPB, TPB policy, as you can see, there are no parametric modeling for this. For um, modeling this P, AI given XI, NI, you can use any method which does not require you to assume GLMM or whatever. So once these Q policies are defined, or well, we can define some estimates. So this mu Q, mu on Q, Michael already gave some uh, intuitions. I will give you mathematical details. So for the mu Q, um, we first uh, average over Y, I, J, A, I potential outcomes here over these Q values. So this summation will be the average of potential outcomes over possible AI, uh, possible AI uh, assignments with these respect probability. Then we average over individuals in a cluster, then we take the expectation. That's the definition of this mu Q. For mu one Q, which is average potential outcome when treated, we do the same thing, but we fix AIJ to be one. Then we allow AI minus J to be over this a n i minus one, and then corresponding probability will be given by this q, where this q is probability of all units in cluster i other than j receiving treatment a i minus j under policy q. This definition is very interesting because if there were no interference, we know that this potential outcome will not depend on this part. So we can just simply express this by y i j one then this mu one Q will reduce to this one because this is the same quantity and the summation of Q will sum up to one. So we see that mu one Q does not change over Q if there were no interference. So this definition can give some idea whether the change of mu one Q with respect to Q will um, provide some information whether there are interference or not in your data. We can also define the same thing when untreated by changing one by zero here. So once you have these three kind of causal estimates, 
you can also define causal effect uh, as Michael had expl explained. The first one would be direct effect of Q, uh, which is mu one Q minus mu zero Q, um, the treatment effect on the policy Q. So for example, what is the vaccine effect on COVID-19 when 50% of neighbors were vaccinated? It might be different if Q were different. We can also think about overall effect, which compares two policies overall. So it will answer the question like, what is the difference between overall COVID-19 risk when 50% versus 30% of neighbors were vaccinated? We also define spillover effect when treated, which is uh, mu1q minus mu1q prime. The difference between a vaccinated individual's risk of COVID-19 when 50% versus 30% of neighbors vaccinated. We can also define spillover effect when untreated by SE0. Um, before I move, go to next slides, do you have any questions? Because I know it's kind of new, new concept, so there might be some confusion points. Yeah, I read for- um, We don't have uh, questions for now. Uh, we, we encourage you to submit your question if you have them and yeah, don't wait for yeah. us to stop. Yeah. Thanks. That's good. Yeah, so, so far we define our culture estimates and then now we want to do inference on those culture estimates. We need some identifiability of these estimates because they are defined based on potential outcomes. So we assume those kind of five assumptions, which are um, extension of standard culture assumptions to the cluster integrant setting. So consistency, conditional exchangeability and positivity, they are all in the cluster level. We also assume finite moments and finite cluster size for um, our further inference. So under those assumptions, we have identifiability of culture estimates, uh, which is given by this lemma. So here, a good thing is that the every culture estimate that I just explained previously, they can have this kind of form where this W uh, stands for weight function for each culture estimate. So for example, overall effect will have specific W function, spillover effect will have a, a corresponding W function. So if you change this W function, that will give you corresponding culture estimates. So using this unified form of our culture estimates, we can do inference because this W function is um, observed, observed um, is based on observed data, data or just known function. And this, is, this also can be um, deduced by observed data distribution. So once we have this identifiability, uh, our proposed method is using non-parametric efficient uh, influence function and construct uh, estimator based on these EI apps. So I will go with uh, first theorem. Um, so the reason that we care about the EI app of W is because W can be depend on the observed data distribution. So thinking about like GLM and policy, we uh, we motivate our policy based on GLMM, which is data observed data distribution. In the case, the W function will depend on data distribution. But in the case of type B policy, the policy itself does not uh, based on um, observed data distribution. So here W will not be a function of data distribution. So it'll be more clear when I, when I go to example policies, but so we need to care about EIF of this W function also. Once we have that, then we have the EIF of our culture estimates is given by this bar phi star. We apply this theorem to the mu q, uh, expected average potential outcome, then we will get this kind of uh, EIF. And if you're familiar with this non parametric EIF stuff uh, in classical culture inference, you might immediately understand this looks really similar to the W robust estimator or a AIPW estimator for the ATE. The first part here, summation over AI, is well, over outcome regression, which is weighted sum of outcome regression. So we denote this by conditional expectation of yi given ai and xi. And then there are some weights to sum up this conditional expectation over ai values. And then this part is basically a residual of yi minus the expected value of yi given ai, xi, and i. And this part q divided by p works as a uh, weight. So in the AT sense, Q is deterministic. So it will always give you one or like something like indicator of AI equals one. So it has really similarity to the um, AIPW estimator in the uh, no interference setting. So once we have this kind of EI apps, 
um, we want to construct these estimators based on these EIFs, but there are some problems that we need to estimate some functions appears in the EIF, uh, and then we call them as nuisance functions that are unknown functions. Uh, in our framework, we need to estimate these four nuisance functions, which is G, H, W, and phi. So G is um, conditional expectation of yi given ai, xi, ni. And the h is probability of ai given xi, ni. So good news is that wm phi usually depends on this h function. So if once you are done with estimating g or h, then wm phi will be automatically given uh, from the h estimate. But it, it highly depends on your policy of interest. But in our cases, uh, it will depend on h. So we only need to estimate g and h. Uh, if you are willing to use parametric modeling, you can use just use G, generalized linear mixed model for estimating G and H. However, using parametric uh, estimations is there is a chance of model misspecification. So to avoid those kind of risk, we uh, recommend to use data active method uh, with something like mixed defect machine learning models or smooth color regression for dependent data, uh, etc. There are more easy way to estimate the nuisance functions. Uh, once we are okay with uh, assume that if yijs are independent and aij is independent given those uh, covariate factors, but not necessarily marginally independent, which means that treatment selection might be independent in a cluster. Then we can estimate individual outcome regression and individual propane score instead of G and H, the vector level. We further assume some specification like this G function is expectation of yij given ai, xi, ni. And then we assume this expectation only depends on the j's individual itself's treatment and then proportion of other individuals' treatment and then itself's covariage. Then we can define this function as g star of aij, comma, ai minus j bar, comma, xij. The virtue of doing this uh, specification is because our original function, g function, has domains which will vary by uh, ni. If ni were three, then this AI, ve AI vector will be three dimensional vector. If ni was five, this will be five dimensional vector. So it'll be really hard to apply a uh, standard regression method. Once you have this kind of mis uh, specification, then G star has fixed domain. AIJ is always binary. This is always proportion, so between zero to one. And this will be just our um some domain of xijs. We do the same thing for the propane score uh, by specifying these propane score is actually the only function of xijs. Again, we can use GLM for parametric estimation, but to avoid modern misspecification, we can use data or tape method. For here now, we can use any method actually, because it's just regression problems. You can use support vector machine, random forest. And in our paper, we propose to use so Polonar, which is ensemble of um, data directed method. Before I move on, I see a question, so maybe I can stop. Yeah, Thomas has a question on the um, your assumptions. Can you go back to your five assumptions? Um, is this an assumption on the underlying potential outcomes? Um, yeah, I think this is just the uh, usual sort of causal consistency assumption um, in the setting where we have uh, clustered interference, right? So in the absence of interference, this would say something like the observed outcome Y is equal to Y naught indicator A is zero plus Y one indicator Y is one. Oh, sorry, Thomas. It was, it was not on that. Uh, Chama, it was on the more recent slide. Uh, maybe this one? Or yes. this one? Yeah. Uh, so maybe you want to take this? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, so I guess for here, we do not think very much about potential outcomes because we have our identifiability of our culture estimates. And now everything is the on the observed data level. So nuisance functions by their names, they are not important. They are just functions that we need to estimate and plug into the uh, estimators. So by any means, if you are able to estimate this function, they'll be fine. So here we just try to estimate this function here, G function, uh, and then there are no need to think about potential outcomes here. Thanks, Chama. 
And then Jung Ho Lee also has a question. Would you mind explaining why estimating W or phi follows from estimating H? Yeah, sure. Um, it'll be more clear if I give more examples, but I can just give a quick answer for that. Because, oh, okay, for here, TPP policy, you see Q function um, is given by, so here, probability of AI given XI NI will be H of AI comma XI NI. So you see that this Q function is actually function of H's. So once you're able to estimate H, then this Q will be given automatically. And then again, this W of H, they, are defend, they depend on Q values. So like here. So that's how, so that's your choice of policy will, um, will inform you uh, whether you need to estimate W or fee. And in our examples, we don't need to. Does it answer your question? It's good, thank you. Let's keep going, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the questions. Um, so under these nuisance function estimators, we are now remaining to estimate the actual estimator. <laughs> and then now we propose to use sample splitting estimator. So the idea of sample splitting estimator is to avoid uh, multiple use of data. So it's very similar to cross-validation. We split our entire data, O1 through OM, to two parts randomly. So I denote by O1, 1 to 1 through M1, and O1, 2 to OM to 2. And with this first procedure, we fit our nuisance functions with this blue part. And then we plug in these nuisance functions to our EIFs. And then we evaluate uh, this EIF with this orange part. So this OI is from orange and then this eta is from uh, blue part. So basically these two are independent. We also do the same thing with the rolls of positive. Then we take this average of these two to get the our as the proposed estimator. And a standard deviation uh, of these two will give you um, a standard deviation estimator, standard error estimator over your proposed estimator. So uh, here's mathematics. Um, again, this, uh, we think about K uh, groups. So we split the data into K groups. And then for each little K group, there are MK um, uh, clusters. And this SI is group membership. We only take the average where this group membership uh, is equal to K. So we take the average of these uh, EI apps within the group K. Then we take the average over this average uh, EI apps to get our proposed estimator. And the SD is the same, um, taking SD. Uh, there are two, some concerns about computations here. First thing is that um, if you remember, if you recall the this part B, there were our regression part, which has summation over AIs. And this can be really computationally intensive if NI is greater than like 20, something like that. So we propose to appro approximate this by uh, random sampling. So we sample AIQ, uh, random sample from ANI, and then take the um, mean of them and multiply by 2 to the NI. Also, because we are using sample splitting estimator, this might introduce finite sample variability. So we repeat the sample splitting S times then take the median of S estimators to get a split robust estimator, which is suggested by Chernjuko in their paper. Um, so before I go to theoretical research, I want to give you some intuition of why, why it works here. So this Psi W, Psi hat W is our proposed estimator. And then this Psi W is the true estimate. Once you take the subtraction of these two, you will get this kind of uh, decomposition. Um, and then if you see the first term, this bar phi is such a function and eta is a true function. So this is just a function which is unknown, but a function. So we know that um, this quantity will converge to normal distribution using central limit theorem. Here, PMK, you can think like just a sample average within group K. And then this P is just an expectation operator. And then this part, PMK minus P times uh, phi hat minus phi, usually, you need to use Dong class. class. Uh, you need you need you to use empirical process wizard to deal with this term. But by virtue of sample splitting, we know that these OIs and that these eta hat they are independent. So we can use very simple uh, statistical tool to get this nice um, bounding bounding wizard. So the goal is to bound these norm between these two uh, quantities. 
And finally, this term, which will give you second order remainder, uh, which makes our uh, estimator more robust, uh, given that this RWIRG, I will give you the details, but they are convergence rate. They are all in the second terms. So they are multiple of RGRH, which allows us to have, if some estimator, nuisance estimator is not fast, the other one could compensate that. Uh, so here are some conditions. I will go really quickly. So this B1 through B4 is about boundedness of the nuisance function estimators. And B5 through B8 are just convergence rate of these uh, nuisance functions. And here, this norm is vector norm, Euclidean vector norm. And then this norm is uh, L to P norm. Um, so under these mild conditions, such that nuisance function estimators have convergence rate of m to the one fourth, then our proposed estimator has option to take normality convergence to standard normal distribution. Furthermore, this standard error um, estimator converges to the non parametric efficiency bound of psi w. Therefore, our proposed method uh, is consistent and option typically normal and non parametric efficient estimator. Um, here are some examples. So for type B policy, uh, first of all, because the policy itself does not depend on uh, data distribution, we got this phi equals zero. Then our consistency is given when either outcome regression or the probability function is consistent. It does not need both of them to be consistent. And for the assumed normality, their product needs to be m to the negative one, four, one, one half. However, it's not true for SIPS policy because SIPS policy itself highly depends on the propensity score pi. So it requires consistent estimation of pi function. However, once pi is consistently estimated, we don't need G function to be consistently estimated. But for the assumed normality, we also require strong, uh, strong condition for pi, but for G, it can be slower than m to negative one fourth as long as pi is faster than that. And for TPB, the same thing here. Uh, we have some more uh, advanced theorems. Like if you think about collection of policies, if for example, collection of type B policies indexed by some alpha values, then you will get weekly convergence to the Gaussian process. It's more, even more leisure than assumptive normality. Um, also, you have the same result for a SIPS policy, but you don't have it for TPB policy because TPB policy basically has some uh, discontinuity in this fully policy uh, construction. So here are some simulation settings. Um, there are 500 clusters, and then cluster size varies from 5 to 20. And there were three uh, covariates, which one, one is cluster level and two are individual level. And then we assumed non-linear uh, pi ij and gij functions for treatment and then outcomes. And then we are interested in SIPS policy estimates with constant delta. And then we implement a sample splitting estimator with two splits, 100 times of um, sampling to approximate outcome regression, and then only one repetition. And then we compare non parameter and parametric method for nuisance function estimators. For non parametric, we assume we use super runner of this uh, method. And for parametric, we only use rigid regression. And here's the result. For the left panel, this is non parametric result. And for the right panel, this is parametric result. We see that BIOS and RMSA is well controlled for non-parametric, but it's not for parametric. And then most importantly, 95% uh, cover confidence interval coverage achieves nominal level for non-parametric method, but not for parametric method. Uh, finally, we applied our method to the Senegal demographic and health survey data. Uh, and then the main question of this analysis was whether water, sanitation, and hygiene facilities decrease diarrhea incidence among children under close interference. There has been some research, there might be um, some interference effect. So we want to actually evaluate um, whether this is really interference or not. Uh, our interest was when we apply SIPS policy and when we apply TBP policy, what would be uh, potential outcomes and what would be causal effect? So in this setting, there were uh, almost thousand clusters, uh, which are census blocks. And then each census block, there were household uh, where there are two to uh, up to the 12 households in a census block. And then for the outcome for each household, it was whether all children in the household were diarrhea free. So YAJ, YIJ becomes one is a better outcome. And then AIJ is the wash facility uh, status. 
and XIJs include demographic and social economic status for each household. We used our proposed sample splitting estimator with superlunar nuisance function estimators, including penalized logistic regression, spline regression, GAM, GBM, random first and neural network. And here's the result. So a key result is that mu and mu1, they are increasing over delta values, which means that if the O's were doubled, if the O's were increased to the observed, then um, the diarrhea free rate will increase. And then it is also true, even if a children is from wash household, their diarrhea free rate will increase. But this mu zero result in, uh, implies that if a children is from um, known wash household, there might not be very interesting effect from others. Uh, if we apply this to the TPP policy, we have the same result. Mu is increasing over low because always the proportion of um, threshold of the proportion of treatment in a cluster. And then mu1 also is also increasing, while mu0 uh, does not show any uh, change very much. So here's a summary of uh, today's talk. Um, so in our in our work, we developed a primary method, which can be used to draw inference about treatment effect in the presence of cluster interference. They can be applied to any treatment allocation policy, which allows for unit propensity to vary by their covariage and are not based on parametric models. Our proposed on parametric efficient sample splitting estimators exploit a variety of data adaptive methods and therefore are robust to model misspecification specification compared to the parametric estimators. And then the application to the Senegal data suggested that having a private water source or flushable toilet wash facility decreases the risk of diarrhea among children, and that children from wash households may receive an additional protective spillover effect from neighboring wash households. Um, yeah, that was, that was it. And then we thanks for our lab members with Chan Park. And then this work was supported by this NIH grant. Um, yeah, here are references. And then, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice talk, uh, Michael and Chen Hua. Yeah, we're switching over to the discussion now. So uh, Chris and Hyunsung, the floor is yours. <laughs> Chris, Great. do you want to start? Sure, yeah, yeah. So I have uh, some uh, notes prepared here. So let me uh, just pull some of those up. Um, let's see. So I, I want to thank the authors for this uh, interesting and in, insightful t t t talk, as well as the or organizers for having me uh, here. Uh, so causal in in inference under interference is a very exciting area, and I really enjoyed both the conceptual con contributions of exploring different estimates, as well as the technical contributions of using sophisticated tools from non-parametric uh, efficiency theory. So I have a few... Um, types of questions pre uh, pre uh, paired, and so it probably makes most sense for me to to bring up one and then and then we talk about it. Uh, so the first is a discussion on what the estimates are. So I, I I found the stochastic policy estimates to be very interesting and insightful. Uh, it's it's especially that there's some kind of heterogeneity that's allowed in the treatment uh, assignments of the policies. Okay, so. One question I have is about um, when it makes sense to consider things like the CIPS uh, policy here and what they may not be capturing and how I might better think about, about that. So the distributions in this paper, uh, the uh, policy dis dis distributions, are assumed to assign binary treatments independently to units in a cluster uh, conditioned on the covariates and the cluster size. So let me describe an example of an experiment that I may want to run uh, that I think doesn't quite fit this. And I kind of want to know um, how to better think about, about this. So if the clusters are village and the units are people in the village and the covariates say are in underlying social network of the units in the village, and the researcher may seek to investigate the spillover effect of giving a few influential people access to clean drinking water. Uh, what's that effect on the rest of the people in the village? Uh, but the researcher wants to do a policy where we're going to sample influential people in a dependent uh, way here. So we're going to want to ensure that the chosen people are well spread out throughout the network, not just those that have high dia, dia agree. Um, so 
I think that in this kind of setup here, that's that's different from the stochastic policy considered in the uh, paper. And so my my question now uh, to, the, to the to the authors is: What are some guiding principles that a researcher might take to de de determine if their research question is well addressed uh, by this type of stochastic policy? And is it possible to consider you know other types of ones that are a little bit more global, like I had mentioned here? I would love to hear the thoughts that you guys have. Um, yeah, I might go first. Yeah, thank you for a very um, insightful question. That's really interesting. Um, one thing that I can say is that the stochastic policies that we are thinking about are more like descriptive. So we are interested in what if this policy were implemented? What would be the potential outcomes? So for example, so for SIFS policy, um, what if everyone's uh, O's were like two times to the observed wars? What would be potential outcomes? Um, so there, there will be more descriptive rather than finding which one is influential, influential people in your cluster. But I guess that's a very interesting idea because in uh, if you're really a policy makers, you want to implement some policies which really affect the like the outcomes. Um, so it might be more like prediction thing to figure out which individuals in a cluster is like important, like variable selections. So. I guess there might be another like potential interesting research topic, but for now in our uh, framework with request policies, we assume that our policy are given before we know which one is influential people. So I guess that's the like the most different thing from our stochastic policies and then the thing that you were mentioned, but it's a really interesting idea, yeah. Uh, Michael, do you have any thoughts to add? Not really. And Chris, it's a great question. And, and Chama, I think that was a great answer. Um, you know, we sit in a school of public health, and, and so we're trying to stay very grounded in reality. Um, and I think we've been motivated by um, just kind of trying to predict from data that we have what might happen um, if somehow, you know, there was an increase in the exposure or an increase in the treatment. Um, but not with sort of specific experiments in mind, like the type you're describing, Chris. Um, so we were thinking of these dis different policies as sort of potentially realistic, but again, not like working with a particular investigator who wanted to implement um, a particular policy. Um, the only other thing I'll add is that I think, um, and you may know this, um, I think Dean Eccles has a paper that's similar to what you're describing, where he talks about sort of all optimal ways to seed a network. Um, I think he's he's in a, I think in a business school. So sort of thinking about, you know, like advertisements and, you know, people who have a lot of influence and um, maybe sort of wanting things to go viral. And of course we're in a school of public health and we don't want anything to go viral. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I, I do wonder if some of the work that Dean and his colleagues uh, have been doing, which is a little different from what we presented today, might be closer to what you're asking about. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'm not, I don't have the fortune yet of, you know, being very close to uh, uh, policymakers or, or interacting with uh, them. But, but in my understanding, right, that your, that your answer partly is like, well, we're interested in, you know, what would happen if, if odds increased not like telling you exactly how they may, ma might might happen. So the example that I was thinking about was kind of like, let's run an experiment in the future. Let's run some policy in the future. And maybe for those types of questions, uh, there's that, but this, but more of like the, you know, what would happen if things just, if the probability were to increase, I'm not gonna think about precisely the policy at which I will do to make that happen, but it's just kind of a thought. Is is that kind of a right way to think about it, or am I a little bit off base there? Yeah, I think that's right. And um, this would probably be a good time for Hyun Song to comment because I think he's done some related work where they've thought about sort of optimal allocation. So in this these wash facilities, you know, if if you had a limited number of them and you could only allocate them to certain households, what would be the optimal way to do that? Uh, and again, that's kind of considering a, a slightly different question than the one we've been trying to answer. 
Yeah, and, and maybe I, I can take this opportunity to jump in on the discussion as well. And I, before I begin and just comment on what Michael said, I just want to also thank uh, both of you for a wonderful talk, really, to, uh, to derive EIF, uh, efficient influence functions under S demands that are, I, I, as Michael mentioned, grounded in reality compared to what we've done before. It was also a bit humbling to see how uh, some of our efficiency theory work and our data set from the Senegal paper kind of used in a different context. And also that you reached out to my uh, really fantastic former student, uh, Chan Park, on this. Uh, by the way, he's on the market if anyone's interested in, in having it as faculty. So I really appreciate it. Uh, uh, giving a lot of support. So yeah, so to reach, I, I think to comment on Michael's point and about policy learning, I, I think it's an interesting aspect of this liter literature that hasn't been really discussed as to how do you learn, uh, because ultimately you want you to learn the estimates of the uh, effect of the vaccine or effect of some spillover type effects. You want to use that information to optimally allocate um, policy in a cluster or maybe in different kind of clusters or seeding in a different way. And I, I think this is one great up, um, one opportunity because to get there closer because a lot of the estimates that you guys are studying are more close to reality. And na the natural question is, can, is there an optimal row parameter for the tips? Um, one of the things you're TBT, TBP you're talking about, or maybe that optimal lambda parameter for a CMS um, that you could choose as just ways of starting to think more policy the perspectives. And actually, the the theory that you skipped a little bit of the the Gaussian process uh, um, could be one opportunity to get at least the statistical properties of search um, policy estimated policies. But yeah, I I think that's something that as a whole, we should start to think a little bit more about, because ultimately that's what I think policymakers, I, again, I don't work as closely to the data as Michael would have, but my interaction with them is that they really care about not only estimating these effects, but really trying to deploy them to see which, should Madison get certain vaccines in Matt, uh, uh, versus uh, you know, Chapel Hill or like Stanford, California, depending on the clusters at hand. And I think that would really start to transform how these methods are used in practice down the road. I, so I, I so I have a few more questions here, but I but I would I would love to hear. Oh yeah, sorry. I would I would love to uh hear either either more questions from 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 you here or what the what the what the speakers thought or, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I can at least maybe pose one question that I also bother uh, also is on my mind, um, or maybe two if I have time, but. One is, uh, so whenever we analyze data, especially for causal inference, we talk about covariate balance, uh, balancing covariates in observational studies so that people look comparable between the treated group and the control group. And this is very obvious in the case without interference. With any sort of interference, whether it be partial or not, uh, or general, and even for different types of estimates under partial interference, this seems to be much more of an ad hoc task then, um, then there's a principled approach to it. And we do this a lot whenever you run randomized clinical trials that our randomization did was, perf was done properly to compare covariates. But I was just curious what your thoughts are on this because we, you and I, it seems like we analyze almost similar data for Senegal. And we have an entire appendix in that paper on, on just <laughs> ad hoc covariate balancing just to see that you know, people who uh, had the toilets are comparable to people who don't have the toilets. But I, I was wondering if you thought more about this or and it, it, specifically in the context of some of the new estimates you introduced, because this problem has been bothering me for about three, four years. And there hasn't been I, I, I just use what I think is right. But I don't know if there's something that <laughs> is something that maybe you guys are thinking better about that. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to or maybe throw it out there as well. Yeah, I, I don't have I mean, have we thought about it? No. That's <laughs> the short answer. Um, so I, I think it's, it, I, I need to go back and look at your paper more closely and see what you all have done. Uh, I think it's a great idea. Um, and I know others, um, Georgia, Chris, others have thought about interference uh, as well. So they may want to comment. So I've thought about interference, but I have not thought about like uh, balancing covariates and observational studies. But what seems kind of, yeah, tricky is that the, the, uh, when there's no interference, you sort of break up, uh, naturally into two groups, those that got the treatment and those that did not. And the, and the estimate is also broken up clean, cleanly there. And so I just sort of suspect that if you were trying to, you know, do some checks for covariate balance, 
and and stuff like that's an observational study with interference, you know, you have to use the structure of your S demand uh, a bit. Is is my is is my feeling. So um, I don't know how to phrase that well, but it's just my uh, in in to in intuition. Yeah, like I, being balanced in some ways. Oh, sorry. Yeah, please. I, I completely agree with Chris. I actually like thinking about all these optimal locations. Uh, I think that we should only be considering optimal locations that are achieving that for which we can have covariate balance in our clusters to estimate them. Uh, so the I think that when we want to talk about covariate balance with these types of stochastic interventions, we want to talk about averages of covariates in the cluster under this intervention or that intervention being similar. And unless we can, unless a reweighting procedure is balancing those expected covariate under the, inter the two interventions, we shouldn't be est using them to estimate quantities. So I think that there has to be some kind of penalty in our in our whatever optimal treatment allocation in the cluster has to be to penalize away from estimates and potential policy allocations that for which we don't have covariate balance. Um, I actually think that this would be great. Somebody has to do it. <laughs> So I so I do have one more question here. Um, well, I have a, a few, but I see that you know the the time is getting close. So so the one that I've that I've been most interested in to hear about how you guys think about this is that um, uh, I see this like t t t t tension uh, in interference uh, re research, um, uh, which is that there's like this semi-parametric and non-parametric kind of theory. And what it's really good at doing is it's really great at um, getting estimators that we know are optimal in some kind of way. And it's got a lot of theory. And you guys have used that in your in your paper, uh, a great uh, a great tail. Um, and I think that's great. Uh, but on the other hand, they often make, you know, that kind of theory makes these IID assumptions. It lets us. It makes it hard to think about like one uh, cl cluster, let's say, or one larger network, or something like like that. On the other hand, design-based inference. There, they have you know certain tools for thinking about you know one large cl cluster or one network you're doing experiments on. But there's not a lot of theory of like, well, this estimation method is is you know optimal in some way, or this es estimation method. So I see that kind of being something that um, uh, seems kind of hard, but not diff like not impossible to overcome. And I'm wondering, you know, since your paper blended these two in a very nice way, I'm wondering how you guys think about this. Do you see the same t t t tension there, or or uh, yeah, how do you how do you think about about that? Yeah, that was really a good point. Um... So in our um, framework, in our method, we assume that we sample from superpopulation, we sample cluster level data, and then we assume that the sample size goes to infinity. So within, within cluster, there might be de dependence, but sample itself, cluster itself are independent units. So we can apply the usual same parametric efficient theory, which is based on IID um, method. So that's okay. But as you mentioned, there were also growing literature about general interference. So here, general interference, I mean that if there are only one big cluster and there are dependence within individuals, those, so there are not infinite, infinite sample. So how can we do um, interference restriction there? So one possibility is that they are using graph, math, uh, graph theory very actively. So so very common assumption is that within the graph, if the, the graph is sparse enough compared to the graph size, then they can use Stein's method, which give you uh, central limit theorem for uh, in the, uh, dependent data, which will give you some estimator to the inference. But I'm not sure whether they can insist that they are like optimal or they are efficient, like we do in semi-parametric efficient theory for IID data. But at least under some conditions with graphic th graph, graph theory, they can do um, inference on this bit general interference um, thing. Yeah, but yeah. Actually, what uh, some of my colleagues in our lab 
uh, they are doing that work. So maybe if they write a paper, then we, uh, I can refer them to you. So um, Michael, do you have any thoughts? No, yeah, no, nothing really to add. Um, we, we've, um, we've worked on randomized experiments on networks and observational data with clusters, but that the hardest problem in my mind is observational data on network. Um, and and as, as Chamwa said, we've been thinking about it a little bit and trying to use some approaches similar to what a few other folks have done. There have been some papers for observational data on network, but we, we haven't really worked on that problem too closely because it just seems to be the hardest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems it seems hard to uh it's not hard to like develop esta esta estimators, but it's hard to make statements like this is the best est estimator no. here. And so that has been bothering me quite a bit. Um but uh yeah, that would be, you know, the best of both uh worlds. But thank thank you. Yeah, thank thanks you. for this. Thanks. We're slowly running out of time, but like May Hyunsen, do you have like a, a short one or? I, I, I it probably is going to turn into a long one, so I'll, 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 I'll stop here. Uh, but I mean, you get wonderful talk, but I really enjoyed listening. And then uh, it's, yeah, thank you for uh, entertaining. Yeah, it was a wonderful way to spend an hour for sure. Thank you. All yeah. right, then let me quickly close it up. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, uh, Michael and Chanwa for the talk and Chris and Hyunsen for the very nice discussion. Um, also, thank you for the participants for joining. Next week, we're going to have Caleb Miles from Columbia University, who will talk about two fundamental problems in causal mediation analysis. Thank you all for coming. I hope you have a great week and see you next time. Thank you. Bye, all.